Hi, this is Bart Polson, and this is the second half of Chapter 1, What is Lifespan Development for Psychology 1100 Lifespan Development? And in this part, we're going to look at research methods that are frequently used in developmental research. Um, very quickly, we have naturalistic observation methods, case studies, correlational studies, uh, experimental studies, longitudinal, cross-sectional, and developmental research, and, and ethical considerations. We'll try to look at each of those pretty quickly. Okay, the first thing that we're going to look at is naturalistic observation. And what this means is uh, studies that are conducted in the field, uh, sometimes you'll call them data in the wild. That is, it's the natural or real-life settings in which things happen. In these kinds of studies, in field studies, investigators go out to where the people are, and they observe the natural behavior of children or uh, adolescents or adults in, in their natural habitat, in homes, playgrounds, classrooms, at work, wherever, and the researchers try not to interfere with it. They just kind of stand off to the side, and they're looking at what it happens. Also, researchers may try to, you know, blend into the woodwork by sitting quietly in the back of a classroom or by observing uh, a group of people through a one-way mirror. These are uh, a lot of different ways. And what it is is this has a lot of what's called ecological validity, meaning it matches the real situation very well. Um, it does require that things be observable. Um, so really, this does kind of get to the behavioral aspect of things, but it, it is a... Uh, a very common form of research, when, especially when you're looking at young children, because you want to see how they react naturally. The next kind is a case study. And in this um, situation, what you're going to do is you're going to do a very careful, thorough account of a single person. Uh, case studies um, often use a lot of different kinds of information. You can have direct observation where you're sitting and seeing what they're doing. You can have questionnaires. You can have standardized tests. You can have interviews, uh, public records like health or criminal or educational records. In fact, in a good case study, you'll probably want to use all of those things because you're trying to get as much information as possible about the one person. Um, it's sort of like what happens, uh, by the way, in, in medical school. You'll talk about uh, unusual medical cases. Uh, in business school, you talk about uh, a particular business or product and how it's developing and examine it in great detail. And in law school, actually, you examine legal cases in great detail to see how they affect uh, judicial thinking and precedent. So anyhow, case study, also a common method for psychological research and also in developmental psychology. Uh, I'll just mention, this is also something you'd want to do if you have a very unusual situation. For instance, uh, an unusually gifted or unusually challenged child or a kid who's lived through some very uh, unusual circumstances, you would want to do a case study to get as much as you can from that one uh, person or uh, situation. Now, a very common method in research is what's called correlational. Now, correlation is simply a statistical measure of how much two particular things are associated. So you want to look at whether one behavior or trait, the one that you're uh, studying, is uh, related to uh, another. And then you can look at how you assign numbers to these. Now, you really need to be working with quantitative numbers, quantitative variables here. So they have numbers, different values on them. And then there's a mathematical formula, and you get a number uh, where a zero indicates no linear relationship at all. And the linear is important here because it means it fits on a straight line if you draw a line through a graph. Uh, you can also have, a, it goes up to a positive one, which indicates a perfect linear association, or a negative one, which indicates a perfect negative association. And what's important here is that a negative one and a positive one are just as strong as each other. It's the absolute value that's important here. So let's take a couple uh, look at something here. Uh, here on the left side, we have a positive correlation, and it says the more time you spend studying, the better your grades in school. And that's generally true, and so that's a uh, a positive correlation. It doesn't have to be true for everybody. It doesn't have to be true all the time, but there has to be a noticeable pattern for it to be associated. On the other hand, you can have a negative correlation where higher values on one are associated with lower values on the other. So, for instance, uh, we have frequency of delinquent acts. The more, del you know, juvenile crime a person is involved in, then you see that generally they have lower grades in school. So time spent studying has a positive association with grades in school. Delinquent X has a negative association with grades in school. Um, now, so there's some huge advantages of correlational research, and mostly it's a, you're able to get a lot of data really quickly. And in fact, you're able to get data from public records, you're able to get data from standardized tests, and you can get data from millions or hundreds of millions of people all at once. 
and that's a beautiful thing. On the other hand, correlational research has some serious limitations. Uh, while you may be able to find that there is a statistical association between two variables, that is nowhere near enough to establish that one actually causes the other one. Um, I can give you an example uh, from juvenile crime. I know uh, the research says that uh, simply appearing in juvenile court uh, dramatic is associated with a dramatic increase in the risk of suicide for young adults. On the other hand, it's not that going to court makes people want to commit suicide or that being suicidal makes people commit crimes. Those, those associations are possible. But really what it is is you have a spurious relationship where both of these things are the result of, for instance, um, a very strong negative thing is going on in the person's life of one kind or another. And so both the juvenile crime and the suicidality are simultaneously effects of some other cause. Um, anyhow, a correlation... On, in and of itself is not enough to establish a cause and effect relationship. Um, we'll look at some other ways. In fact, the, the way that you usually deal with this is the next one. It's called an experiment. An experiment is where you're actually um, trying to figure out that this causes changes in that or changes the likelihood or probability of a particular thing. And this is the preferred method. It's generally considered the gold standard for cause and effect research. Now, it has the um, has some of its own challenges. We'll talk about those in a second. Now, the first thing you want to do is you want to come up with a hypothesis, and this is actually an educated guess. Now, here on the slide that the publishers wrote, they're actually wording it as a research question. Um, and you might want to say, how does X affect Y? So let's take a quick look at an example here. You might say, how does TV violence affect aggressive behavior in children? It's a question a lot of people ask. Now, this is actually a question. Uh, if you wanted a hypothesis, it would be a statement. And you would say that uh, increased exposure to TV violence produces more aggressive behavior in children. Then it's a testable statement. And that's a, that's a hypothesis. Um, now, when you actually design an experiment, there are different ways that you can do it. For instance, you usually split people into at least two groups. Now, there, there are so many variations on how experiments are conducted, as there are with case studies and interviews and correlational studies. So this is just one possible method. Um, so you might take people and you split one group of people into an experimental group who, for instance, has a particular treatment, a different way of learning something, a different method of uh, confronting a problem. And then you have a separate group that's a control group. Now, ideally, you have randomly assigned people to these two groups. And what that does is it makes those groups, um, the actual word is probabilistic equivalence, which means that they are, uh, you have a certain probability that they're like each other, that differences tend to cancel out if you randomly assign people. And so you've got your experimental group, you've got your control group, and you may want to do a pretest. You don't have to. Um, it's not necessary, but it can be helpful. So you look at what's called a dependent variable, and that's the outcome that you want to look at. So, for instance, if you're looking at methods of teaching kids math, you're going to look at their scores on math tests. So you might get a pretest on how well they do math before you do anything. Then you can have this thing that says administer the experimental stimulus. Oh, by the way, if you've done your random assignment and you have enough people, and that depends on the situation, there should be no differences between the experimental and control group, no reliable group differences. There will be a lot of differences between individuals, but those differences should cross out across the two groups. Anyhow, the next thing you do is you administer the experimental stimulus. And that means, uh, for instance, in education, you give one group of people a particular kind of instruction, another group of people a different kind of instruction. And then when that's done, however long it takes, you then measure the dependent variable, that's the outcome variable, and you look at that again. And then you look to see if there's a difference. And so, for instance, if your hypothesis was that people who got the new treatment would do better, you expect to see better scores over there. Um, just let's mention very quickly, when you administer this experimental stimulus or a particular program to somebody else, whether they get the uh, special program or not, that is a variable, and it's called an independent variable. It's the one that you get to manipulate, that you control yourself. It doesn't depend on anything else. It's independent of everything else except for what you want. The dependent variable is the outcome that's supposed to be changed because of the independent variable. Um, also, experimenters try to have a lot of experimental control, and that means that they randomly assign people to conditions, and they've got this one or two things that they're trying to make difference for the two groups, but otherwise they make every effort to keep everything the same for the groups. Um, 
Anyhow, and what that allows you to do is to say, no, the only reliable difference between the two groups is this uh, independent variable, this thing that I manipulated. And for that reason, that's why randomized experiments are often considered the gold standard for cause and effect research. Um, also, it is important that the, uh, about the randomized part, it is important that the researcher assign people to one condition or another, because if people get to choose the one they're in, then you have sort of different kinds of people choose different things, and now you have several possible reasons why the groups might be different. I mean, heaven forbid that you had women all choose one condition and men all choose another. Then you have this entire suite of gender differences associated with whatever you got in the outcome. Um, I should mention, by the way, it's not in the slides here, but there is a third approach that combines correlational data with, uh, with methodological and statistical uh, adjustments to try to get the same kind of a conclusion you would get out of an experiment. Those are called quasi-experimental methods. Uh, it's an active field of research, and um, when you take research methodology class, hopefully you'll get to learn more about that. Okay, another kind of research that's common in developmental research is called longitudinal. So you're actually taking one person and you're looking at them over time, or a group of people. So the same people are observed repeatedly, and changes in their development, such height or mental abilities or intelligence or depression or social ability, those things are recorded and can be tracked over time. Now, most longitudinal studies span a month or a few years, though you'll find some that, that go for people's entire lifetimes. Um, they are few because they're so difficult to manage. Um, now, that being said, while this seems like it's the best way to do things, there are some disadvantages and drawbacks to longitudinal studies. The most significant is that, A, it can be hard to get people into the study because it's a major, it can be a major commitment. I mean, imagine one that's going to last an entire lifetime. Uh, also, you have people who fall out of the study. They either they move away and they don't keep track or they, they just don't want to be in the study anymore. And when people don't want to be in, you've got to let them out. And so you can end up with a, an unusual group of people who are left over, um, and that can bias some of the results. And so, again, it turns out that this is, in a way, it's a correlational study. It's over time. If you get a lot of data, there's ways of adjusting for these things, but it can make things a little tricky. Um, now, the w typical contrast with a longitudinal study is what's called cross-sectional research. And what this is, is you go out right now and you get a whole bunch of people of different ages. So, for instance, right here in 2012, you can get people who are four years old and you can get people who are eight years old, who were born in uh, 2004 and 2008, respectively. And you can kind of look at the differences between the two of those. Then what you do is you wait a few years, maybe. You can do it again. You can get people of different ages. Um, or you could just gather people of all different ages right now and look at the differences. Now, um, you might want to try to choose people at random. And then the problem is, if you find differences right now between people of different ages, it may not be because that they have developed or matured. It can also be strong cohort or cultural or simply a year that you grew up effect. And, and that can be a big thing. Um, also, uh, one way to get around that is actually to do what's called the, um, the cross-sequential research design. You see that line going up the, the diagonal? We have eight-year-olds in 2012 and eight-year-olds in 2016. That's a nice thing because it actually lets you look at how much of it can be attributed to the age itself versus the year in which they were born. And so it does get it more complicated because now you're doing both cross-sectional and longitudinal research. But it um, again, it's a richer kind of data. Now, finally, I want to say just a few things about ethical considerations. Now, this slide, uh, you have a person uh, fitting a... a a kid with a, um, a a cap with electrodes for measuring brain activity. It's just EEGs, uh, but it's a nice way of measuring roughly what's going on in the brain. Now, it says here that this infant is being prepared for a psychological study to determine if he recognizes his mother's face. Fine, that's good. And then it says, is the psychologist proceeding in an ethical manner? Well, we have absolutely no way of establishing that from a photograph. She's not poking him with sharp sticks, but you know, mostly the important thing here is that ethical guidelines, there's a couple of things that are really, really important in research. Number one is that people have to know what they're getting into. That's called informed consent. Now, with children, um, you have to talk with their parents. They're minors, and they're under the, you know, the, the custodians of these other people. Um, and so the parents have to know what their children are getting into. 
the children themselves do not necessarily, especially if they're infants, are not going to, but if they're old enough, it's a good idea to let them know. So that is informed consent. The other thing that has to happen is voluntary participation. And this means people can choose whether they want to be in the study or not. And so obviously you can't force people to be into a study. You do get into a funny situation with researching with children because it's the parents' consent that's important. Now, in the history of psychology, there have been some, of course, you know, gross violations of ethical principles, or there have been things that are typically not considered acceptable now. Um, but I want to mention one in particular. Uh, one of the founders of behaviorism, John Watson, did a study uh, with a child who was known as Little Albert. And what they wanted to see, uh, Watson and his uh, research assistant, uh, they wanted to see whether you could condition fear of things that kids were not naturally afraid of. So they took little Albert and they put him in a room with a, um, I believe it was a white rat, and, and he's a little kid. And now they did all of this with the permission of the child's mother. She knew it was involved. She gave her consent. That's important. A lot of people neglect that. They act like they just snap some kid up. And um, anyhow, the um, and what they did is they associated every time the kid touched the rat, they'd ring a loud bell and it would scare the kid. And then they would see if it would generalize to other things that were fuzzy or white and and so on. And uh, the unfortunate thing is um, they did all of this, and then they were going to do a desensitization where they tried to undo some of the fears that they caused. But the, uh, Albert left before they could do that part. Anyhow, a lot of people talk about this as some sort of gross violation of research ethics. Now, it is true you are not supposed to cause harm to your participants. On the other hand, if you, medical research causes harm all the time, what it is, you're not supposed to cause unnecessary harm to which people did not consent, and they need to be able to you know, revoke their consent. Now, to the extent that that was or was not uh, happening with Little Albert's case, we don't know for sure. Um, the study probably would not be approved exactly as it was done back then, but truthfully, there's nothing to say that small uh, variations couldn't be helpful. Research is important. Research matters, and the things that researchers do are significant. On the other hand, people's rights to know what they're getting into and to participate freely are also very important. It becomes more complicated with children because you have both the children and you have the parents in there involved, and uh, the extent to which the parents are actually representing the child's best interest um, is something that needs to be considered fully. Anyhow, those are some of the common methods that are used for studying development in psychological research.